Talking Reds Fridays, Talking Reds here with myself, Gareth Roberts. Got Damien Cavana with me this morning. Nice one for joining me, mate. Um, and yeah, you know, the season's finished, the football's over, the Reds are still champions, and there's loads to talk about. Uh, so that's why, we're, that's why we're doing a Talking Reds. Top of the agenda is Jamal Lewis. Uh, no doubt you've all heard that Liverpool have put in a bid of around £10 million for the Norwich left back. Uh, this has been rejected. Um, they are putting it sort of fairly bluntly on the record that they're, they're after around 20 million quid for the Northern Ireland international. Uh, Liverpool, a team, don't want to pay that. And now we, we see stories leaking out about an alternative target in terms of a, a Greek left back. Um, I just find Damien now sort of at my age, um, the whole transfer dance quite amusing. Do you know what I mean? Like even like the language used, everything about it because... You know, I've got I've got a report in front of me here, and it says uh, Norwich are unhappy with Liverpool's conduct in the pursuit for Lewis, and they consider the offer offer derisory. derisory. Whenever, derisory. whenever is that word used in any other context other than when bids go in for for football players? I love it. I love all the, the language around transfers. But what, what in general, what do you make of this one? Because it seems like from what we hear and piecing the the pieces together, it seems like Jamal fancies the move. Uh, which you can't blame him. I mean, would you rather have Rotherham away with Norwich next season or would you rather play for the world champions? I mean, it, it, you know, it's one of them, isn't it? Um, left back, 22, left footed, likes to get forward. Um, scored an absolute cracker against Leicester. That was the only goal he got yeah. in the season just gone. Um, we did a bit of a more in-depth show on him yesterday for subscribers uh, where we talked about his stats in depth because we've got a... A partnership with Stats Bomb, which means we can look into a lot of the stuff that you don't generally see out there. So mm. a lot of people will just look at goals, assists, and then say, oh, well, he doesn't sound very good. But when you dug into the stats, you can see, for instance, he's great at carrying the ball and things like that. And I think I think we've reached a stage, haven't we, mate, where we can trust the club right now in terms of who they target because track record's brilliant in recent times. Oh, totally trust it. I mean, first thing I'd like to say is the first time you've ever brought your age into it rather than mine in a conversation... <laughs> The whole transfer thing, yeah, until I see them with the, with the red shirt, I'm not, kind of not interested, you know. Yeah, I hope Rob Gutman's not listening to this. I know, I'm, yeah. I'm on the opposite end of that, you know. <laughs> and I love listening to him, he's brilliant. He, he just makes me smile all the time. But this kind of transfer to me makes a lot of sense. I'm not saying I, I know a great deal about Jamal other than what your average Premier League fan would do. But we're, we're flying on one engine on the left-hand side, aren't we? Millie came in and done a sterling job. But, you know, when you're watching him, great job that he's done. He's got to stop. He's got to check inside. He's not going to be quite as quick. This boy's a natural left footer. Naturally wants to go forward, up and down, very quick. Very quick. He's so versatile. Now, I, I think, I don't necessarily think that Liverpool would then be looking for him to play in a number of positions. I think that what Jürgen likes about versatile players is that they've got a bit of a brain. They've got a bit of tactical nous about them and maybe they can adapt. And so what, because... The fullback position at Liverpool is effectively two positions, isn't it? It's yeah. right half and right right wing on the right. Do you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't usually consider just being you know an old school fullback. So if this lads um, and and it really does if this comes through and it turns out to be a good sign, and it really would um, it would smell very much of Jurgen Klopp, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm, I back myself to get this lad with these raw ingredients, put him in the reserves for a number of months. And he's going to be great cover on the left hand side. I mean, you know, that that's the Andy Robertson story, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and I think that that's that's surely the you know, as well as Liverpool itself and what I mentioned about, you know, the trophies we currently have in our possession and things like that. It, it's that which is surely attractive for Jamal as well, because you know, he can see now a track record of literary players in his position, even down to, you know, a club that's been relegated the same as Robertson, uh, and then coming in. As you say, you know, a, a bit of a transition period. And now Robertson, you know, Robertson by his own admission, he's a great lad, isn't he? And, you know, he's very down to earth. Yeah. And when you've heard him talk about it, he's still got that big smile on his face where he's like, oh, this is just an absolute dream come true. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. Jamal yeah. must be looking at that and going, I fancy a bit of that. Yeah, and that doesn't mean uh, that he's going to end up being as good, anywhere near as good as Robbo. All he's got to do is be a good deputy, a good yeah. alternative, a good guy who you can play on some on some matches where you know the opposition are going to play 11 in goal. A good guy where you say, well, yeah, we're going to take yeah. um, 
we need half an hour just to take some, you know, to take some of the legs off Robertson. You know, he plays so much. Liverpool's in an unusual position, aren't they now? Because it's like, who do you get in to replace? Never, never mind signing for sign and see. This signing would be someone to fill the bench. Yeah. And we haven't got a natural left-sided attacking player. A uh, young player, obviously, that Jürgen will fan- and his staff will fancy moulding in, in the image that they want. And th- it's a winner for this, lads, because he'll have Liverpool on his CV if he gets the move. And he'll have, ex- you know, it, the, the nature of the fact that he will be improved. There's no question about that. And he might say, well, OK, I'll have two years. I hardly get a game, but I move on and I'm, I'm established in the Premier League. Equally, I'm one injury away from playing in a big final. You know, so yeah. there's all, the, all these things to, to put together. So um, I'm not saying he's the best left back in the world. I mean, to me personally, if you would ask me to choose, I had a tough like, you take like Kieran Tierney at Arsenal. Yeah, he's a bad and player, fabulous. Uh, unfortunately for Scotland that they've got two boss players in the same position. But, you know, that sort of cover, you, 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 can Liverpool afford that to, to, to have a rotated player on the bench? You know, has Liverpool got that kind of budget? No, they haven't, quite clearly not. Would do Arsenal and would Arsenal sell them now? quite clearly not. So you can't be using with other options. So we're not looking necessarily for someone to come in and say, this is going to be the first choice left back that's going to win the European Cup. We need an able deputy. And yeah. Robertson um, certainly has proved to stay in power, but there will be occasions in it, but it's going to be a very congested season where we need to take some of the pressure off him. And if you pick the moments right and we get an even break look with the injuries, it could be the perfect choice. Yeah, it's going to be a game pretty much every three days, um, and with the with the sort of congested season, as you say, and you know, as as Liverpool, we're we're, we're going to expect to go deep into the Champions League. Mm. Uh, there's maybe even an opportunity to to take one of the domestic cups a little bit more seriously this time because we won't have yeah. the World Club Cup situation. But yeah, with Robertson, uh, 49 appearances in the season just gone, 48 appearances in the season before. So he's played an awful lot of football and it's clearly a problem. And I think we've all been there as well in that you're like, you know, you go the game or latterly you, you sit down in your living room and watch a game. Um, and when the Robertson issue was there, as in you're thinking, what well, could do with a rest? But then you're also going, the drop-off's massive though when he's not on the side. You know, Milner, God bless him, does not want to play anymore at left-back and, and I don't blame the fella. Nico. When he's been moved over there, had a bit of a tough time, looked yeah. far more comfortable on the other side, and again, totally fair enough. And then after that, it's all very stiff and plastered, isn't it? You know, you could maybe put Joe Gomez there and things like that. But as you say, I, I've, I've been saying for a while, you know, we could really do with a decent left footer around. And yeah. they've, always, they've always been rare and they've always been different, and you, you always have to pay a little bit of a premium. A feel for a left footer, so we'll see. Uh, the transfer dance with that one is ongoing, uh, no doubt. It feels like another bit from Liverpool going at some point, uh, mm. and we'll see where we go. Interesting as well. I thought that in this latest offer Liverpool put in, they were offering to put some kind of massive sell on clause in there. Yeah, the Norwich could make you potentially benefit in the future. I thought that was interesting because we're seeing something now, obviously, with United going for Jado uh, Sancho. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that City obviously could benefit from the fact that there's a, there's a sell-on clause yeah. in that from when yeah. they sold them to Dortmund. So, you know, this is the sort of way of the world now, isn't it? And I think eventually they, they do end up twisting Norwich's arm on this one. Norwich will want to stand firm. And I, I, sort of, I, I totally get some of their arguments. They're saying, you know, the Vultures are going to be coming for a few of our players. And if we sell them on the cheap, everyone's going to think, you know, there's a sale on our Carrow Road. So... There's a compromise to be reached, but you've got to sort of, you've got to say that Michael Edwards in recent times has done a great job. So uh, fair play, Michael. Uh, long may it continue. Um, the next one I wanted to do, uh, just got to give this a quick mention. Actually, uh, Mike, who is uh, on Twitter as Twelfth Red, it's Twelfth underscore Red, uh, top lad, a uh, Red who's decided in fairly recent times to just churn out a load of a load of. Merch in his in his spare time, and why not, Mike? Uh, so he's doing cups, he's doing t-shirts, as are lots of people right now. Uh, and he's very kindly sent me this through the post unexpectedly as well. So thanks, Mike. Uh, check out his stuff. It's twelfth red dot big cartel dot com if you want to go to his website as well. And he's done a load of stuff there. So yeah, good lad, Mike. Uh, also, you know the Anfield apps doing merch as well, including this wonderful cup. Uh, and a shout out as well for the old school, one of the originals in in all of this, Mick. Uh, a hat scarf or a badge mm. who has done a wonderful 
Pink Floyd The Wall t-shirt already ordered by me. Uh, I don't even care that some people are going to say that's a Yada t-shirt. I loved Floyd grow, uh, growing up and it's, it's, it's the wall album art, but then with the wall as in the trophy wall. Oh, I like it, yeah. Yeah, I like the sound so, of that. So yeah, it's a it's a belt. You you've got some lads that you seem to uh, you know get get a few t-shirts off as well, haven't you? Dave? Yeah, you yeah, cop, yeah, yeah, cop I clobber. Um, both beginning with K, of course. Um, they're brilliant, and uh, you know, um, it's just very um, up with it. Absolutely hitting the nail on the head, and certainly amongst my friends, extremely popular. Got all kinds of great stuff. I would definitely definitely recommend anyone to get out there on cop I clobber. Yeah, there's loads of stuff out there right now, and I, yeah. I love it, me. I, I, I think, I do. you know, let's, let's celebrate the fact that we're champions. We waited yeah. this long, you know, we're sort of every day, drink from a mug every day. I kind of wish I was, you know, I used to work, live there. I used to live, I didn't live there. I used to work in Manchester for over a decade, and I kind of just, just part of me that wishes I was still there right now. <laughs> just, you know, just opening, that, opening the door that day when we were yeah. finally champions and just going, oh, yeah. I had everyone, but I don't get to do that, but I'm all right. Yeah, you'd have walked into an empty room there. They don't know what was coming. <laughs> the best I got out of that time was when Murphy finally won a, won a match at Old Trafford for oh, us and yeah. we got to go in the next day. That mm. Great times. Um, on sort of uh, looking back, actually, we've got a few things on, on the agenda here today, quite chocker, but uh, today is the day or the anniversary of the day that Titi Kamara uh, made his oh, debut yes. uh, at Sheffield <laughs> Wednesday. In 1999, um, mm. I, I was at that game. I was at uni then mm. uh, in Sheffield, um, and CT got 2.6 million pound from uh, from Marseille. Um, I think no one really knew who he was when he arrived. No, and I, you know what I absolutely love I love about CT. I love everything about him. I saw the smile on your face as soon as his name was mentioned there. But I love. There's a clip kicking round. It's not hard to find, and it's it's a young Jamie Carragher a very scouse young Jamie Carragher, talking about Titi and talking about him in a very sort of forthright manner as you'd expect. And he was yeah. like, I just love it. He, he basically says, uh, you know, when he arrived, the stuff he was doing insane and we thought we'd sign Pelle. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine him saying that, absolutely. And what an impact he had. I, mean, I remember we, we were linked with him and then it was confirmed he was coming. And he played in the UEFA Cup final just before he signed for us. And his team got beat. And right at the death, he missed an absolute sitter for a consolation goal. And I, I was like, and then you look at the kip of him. And he, have you ever seen anyone put a red shirt on that looks less like a footballer than that? It's mad, it's it's just, it just, but it's, and so the expectations, and we were struggling at the time, weren't we? And it was like, oh, God, we're, you know, you know we're, we're shot put in the, in the bargain basement here. And what have we got here? But <laughs> this fella played with a big smile on his face. And he gave us a big smile. And his song was great. And his style of Adam and some of the goals he scored were absolutely spectacular. Yeah. And obviously, a player like that, not everything comes off. And a player like that usually has like a golden 18 months or 12 months in his career. I think we were fortunate that we caught it. And he just fitted in um, with the style of the team at the time. And he was like, yeah. oh, great on the counter. Um, and he had, it was Owen around him at the time, wasn't it? And then Fowler was knocking about and that. And he was just... Uh, the right man in the right place at the right time. It's kind of a Ronnie Rosenthal sort of sign. Yeah. Like he's going to do yeah. a short burst. He's going to be direct. He's going to be... You don't ask him to be tracking back because that's not in the equation. Just celebrate what he's got going forward and he'll do a few bangers for you and he'll, and he'll give you some moments where you're literally out of your seat. And that's absolutely the memory I've got of him. And there's some cracking goals. I mean, I think the one everyone remembers him most for would be the one at Arsenal because we hadn't won there for so long. The ball from Stevie. Yeah, yeah. Great ball. A very cool finish. I don't know if it was Coventry. He scored at the cop end. It was an absolute whale. Is that where he, is that where he like the power's unbelievable? Oh, like, yeah. Really? I mean, it's etched in my mind from behind the goal, not the, not the TV coverage. But if Barnes or Gerrard had scored that, that would be in their top 10 repertoire. It was, yeah. it was that good. And I, I also remember away at Leeds one night. And Leeds were with the business at the time. They were a good I side. And he, he just, he scored a goal. But he just absolutely destroyed them. And he was just going, it was like 10 players around him. He was just walking past them. Yeah. I remember that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember that. Do you know what? That, that, that game you're on about there, I was on holiday then uh, with my girlfriend at the time in a, in a bar in Greece. And for whatever reason, there was hardly any Liverpool fans and there was lots of Leeds fans. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like, I'm, 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 I'm sharing my, my, my team on, even, even though I'm, I am with my girl, you know what I mean? And, like, I was yeah. getting some stick off some of their boys, like, uh, you know, because we do a lot of bevy. Um, <laughs> and when TT's goal went in, I was just round the bar. Oh, 
Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's just exactly me and you. You've just mentioned his name here, and all we're doing is smiling about him. Yeah. He and was and great. Oh, uh, he was, yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, it was Heskey that we signed. And that was the end of him then, because Liverpool had moved up a level there. You know, they'd moved up to a, a more proven player and a player that could be more reliable as a foil for uh, Owen or Fowler or whatever Julia he wanted at the time. But that was, he was certainly a stepping stone on the way. And I'm glad that he's remembered as fondly from the people who were fortunate enough to be around and watching the Reds at that time. All you can ever do is smile about him. And it's not a joke thing. It's not that far from it. Oh, no. He gave us great yeah. entertainment. Yeah. scored some vital goals. And, and he really, I think he surprised everybody. Of the opposite. I think the opposition fans of every team wanted to skit him. But then he did the business against them all. So, I mean, yeah. he, he, only played, he only played in um, 37 games for Liverpool. Scored 10 goals. Mm. Which isn't bad, you know, uh, in itself. But also, there's, there's loads of little things which show, you know, the, the affection that there was for him. So, we had a song, um, yeah. and, and we, we've talked on the Alfie Rap before about, you know, you don't get a song if you're not liked. Uh, no. So, we, so we got, he got a song. Um, he's also, there was a two, it used to be quite a regular thing, the 100 players that shook the cop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I remember that. I think yeah. that, uh, I think that the official website and the, the, the LFC TV used to do. Mm. He did that. On, he did that on a number of occasions, like you know, di- different I- mm. years and things like that. But in the in the two thousand and six poll, uh, so you think about all the players that have played for Liverpool in the history of the club, and yet TT got in ninety yeah, first. Ninety first. Wow, that's well. That, that just shows you the love, yeah, and the affection. That yeah, that's because you know because he wasn't there very long, and he didn't do that much. The goal scoring record doesn't really talk about the journey he was on. It was just you know the skill. And the passion and yeah. the improvisation and all those magical moments. And the fact that he kind of helped us move forward as a club. Like I say, going about Heskey. I'm not saying he was the greatest player in the world. He did a good job again. But it was part of Liverpool coming back to being you know, a team that we, we could be more proud of. So, yeah, he's got all that. And I made up he made that poll. Yeah, he's right. And TC as well. I think the big moment that always sticks in my mind as well in many... So to Liverpool fans' mind is that you know he, he played only sort of hours after his, his father yeah, had passed yeah. away uh, against West Ham and, and scored and you know we found out subsequently the news but he was, he was in tears when he scored and you know you, you just kind of I mean you know I've I've lost my dad in fairly recent times and I just think mm. you know what I, I had every respect for him anyway and now thinking what he you know he would have been going through emotionally at the time to go out on the pitch to score a goal and and to decide to do that. I mean, you know, what's funny about that, Damon, is some of the stuff in terms of why he left in the end, it seemed to be that, you know, like a few players, to be fair, he didn't see eye to eye with, with Julio. Mm. And there were some questions around, you know, his professionalism over that, but I always think, well, you know, he, he, knocks, that out, he knocks that out the park when you say that he, he played only a few hours after his father passing away. Oh, unbelievable, yeah. I mean, and players are unhappy when they're not playing. And a manager's job is to say, thanks for the memories, I'm moving this club on. So I've got no, you know, anyone who falls out with people like that, I'm, I'm quite philosophical about that sort of thing. After losing his father, you know, I, I can only think back what would I would be capable of doing, you know, in the hours after that. We obviously, was, we didn't know at the time. And I think if we had known at the time, the atmosphere in Anfield would have been very strange. And I think a lot of us would have broke down crying at the time when he was celebrating the goal. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the strength that he showed to be able to do that, um, marks him out and it doesn't mean that because he did it he's better than anybody else some people wouldn't have been able to play for months or weeks after or whatever it was that doesn't matter but it just shows you the um, despite him being a flair player don't underestimate his determination and the fact that he was to you know, put himself on the line for the team that way and then perform to the level where he scores a Premier League winning goal 10 out of 10 TT I'd love to bump yeah. into him I'd, I would as well I'd love a pint with TT Kamara yeah. imagine that uh, the full quote from Carragher by the way is when he first came the first three or months, we all thought, what have we got here? Pele! Uh, every time he gave him the ball, he was flicking it over someone's head or scoring some great goals. Unfortunately, it went a bit pear-shaped for him in the end. Yeah. Uh, lo- love that from Carragher. Sums it up really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, uh, what else have we got on the yard agenda? Uh, I've mentioned the, the T-shirt. We've done Jamal Lewis. We've done TT Kamara. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, you may well have seen as well, that a lot of people have been asking about when they can go and see mm. uh, the Premier League trophy. Everyone desperate to go and get a picture uh, with the silverware after the 30-year you know, wait to have it at Anfield. Uh, the club have put out a bit of a statement around that uh, because there are plenty of people asking. 
Um, and basically the score is that they think with the health and safety situation, the pandemic, coronavirus, everything else, that they simply can't open it up for everyone right now. Mm. Uh, everyone will probably remember the scenes after the European Cup win, uh, where they allowed people to, to queue up and come in and have pictures with that. Yeah. You know, there were queues around the block for hours, um, for a week. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of you know, underlines sort of how many people would want to come and do it. Um, the, the trophy has been around um, hospitals and NHS locations in Merseyside uh, in, the, in the last sort of couple of weeks, which I think is a, g- a great move by the club. Yeah. Uh, and they've also, they've also had a series of pilot events where some people have been invited in to come and see the trophy and things mm-hmm. like that. Uh, but the decision for now is that, you know, they say in normal circumstances, they'd like to host a viewing event like they did for the Champions League. Not possible in current circumstances. So we've committed to hosting an event in the future which prioritises the health of our supporters while also maximising the number of fans who will be able to participate. Uh, a date can't be established at this stage, but our commitment's, our commitment's clear and we look forward to a time when it will be safe and possible. So I think it's, it's in a similar place to the parade in that they want to do it, but they just don't feel it's the right time now. Can't argue at all. I mean, you know, we have all yearned so long for this trophy. We all deserve to see it. We all deserve to touch it. We all deserve to take it down the alehouse and go, go and fill it and you know, all <laughs> that. You know what I mean? We all deserve that. Um, and, and the club, of course, have got to look at the social responsibilities and the PR that will be all over that, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, they're just, I, I think they're playing a straight bat. I'll call the club out. <laughs> I have called the club out on here if I think that's necessary. And I'll do it again. Um, but I, I think they're doing the right, the right thing with this one. And like I say, we've got to look after it. The, the demand would be, excessive I understand anyone who's disappointed and I know some people who have got in and, and as far as I'm concerned the people who I know who have been able to get their pictures taken with the trophy have all deserved it and I know a lot more people who also equally deserve it who haven't had the chance yet well we'll get round to it eh? we've got it for the whole season I don't know if you remember how this works Reds but uh, you get to keep the trophy for the season <laughs> yeah um, so we're all right you know and we've got time and I look forward to it you know I, I, I treasure very much um, the last photograph ever taken with me dad by the way which was me and my son and him with the European Cup. Um, so that, that, that's a special moment. And I'd like to catch that up and have a picture with me lads with the, with the big trophy. But it's not the right time just yet. And we'll get around to it at some point. I don't know when. And I just think they're managing it in the right way. And I like the idea that they've gone around to, you know, good places as well. You know, why mm-hmm. not share the love in the way that they can as much as they can? Yeah, all, all that to come. And we'll yeah. update accordingly uh, when we know more about when, when, when that is. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention then before you go, Damien, is BBC Two Sunday. Uh, 10 o'clock, there is a film on called The Australian Dream, say film, more documentary. Mm. Um, and it's directed by Dan Gordon, uh, who also di- directed the Hillsborough film, oh, uh, yeah. the, the brilliant Hillsborough film, mm. uh, which I you know he spoke to you about in 2014. That came out. Anyone who hasn't seen that, it, it is the definitive documentary about oh, yeah. the Hillsborough disaster. It's available just simply by Google. You can find it on various video platforms. Uh, it's a tough watch, but it, it it tells you everything that you need to know, and it was part of, I believe, the the journey towards you know us getting the truth recognised after all these years. Um, but Dan, I've interviewed Dan uh, for a cup of tea show on the Anfield app. It'll be out um, certainly over this weekend before this before this film is out on Sunday. Oh, we, we talked about the Australian dream. We talked about Hillsborough. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about his love of football and everything else. And he was a great fella. Uh, but I watched this Australian dream as prep for that interview and it's fantastic. And I'm not just saying that because I got to speak to Dan. Um, it's about Adam Goods, uh, who's an Australian Football League legend. He experienced racism from the stands. He took that on. He decided he'd had enough. He decided he wanted to stand up for Aboriginal sportsmen, sportswomen, and against racism in general. Mm. And I think given some of the things we've seen in society across the world in recent times, it, it's a timely watch and it's brilliantly put together. Uh, I think what I, the impression I got from Dan, and I know you, you've spoken to him, as I say, Damien, is that one of the reasons he produces such excellent work that he does, like he did with Hillsborough, like he has with the Australian Dream, is he really, really makes an effort to get to know people, to get to know the story. And, you know, even just in a sort of hour or so talking to him, I got the impression that he's a, he's a great bloke. Oh, yeah. I mean, his work, you know, on Hillsborough was stunning, quite frankly. Uh, and I'll go so far to say, as people who, have, who are very close to me, and people who have known me for a very long time and 
who would know my particular story, but it really only got the true depth of it by watching his film. Mm. Because obviously you can only imagine what people are talking about when you see the footage put together in context, in a timely and sensitive manner, et cetera, et cetera. It was an absolute classic. Um, tough to watch, but important. And something that is um, all about education, which is a big thing for me on the subject. So I didn't know anything about this Australian dream thing, but I'll tell you what, I'll be watching it on Sunday. Uh, I did speak to Dan. He was a, he was a belter. He was absolute sound. He was very humble. Um, and I, I enjoyed a couple of long conversations with him. And he, he was just um, very, very, very clear and passionate that he wanted to do the subject that he was addressing as much justice as he could. Mm. So certainly the only involvement I've ever had with him is he, he nailed it. I, I can only give him 10 out of 10 on that. So, and that subject there, of course, is dead important. It's very topical, isn't it? You know, and while mm. things are topical, let's, let's have the conversations. Let's confront the issues. Racism, I mean, how stupid is it? How backward is it? Yeah. You know, the, the inverted logic of it. So, you know, let, let, let's have these discussions and let's see these people who are brave enough on their journeys who can inspire other people to say, okay, I don't have to go as far as other people have had to in the past, but then they can still give me the strength to see what's right and, and stand up for myself if, if things are wrong. Or alternatively, you can see people say, no, I'm not going to have that on. I'm not going to have that happen to other people because I can see that this is wrong. Yeah, great stuff. I'll look forward to that. Yeah, Adam, Adam was called an eight by a 13-year-old opposition supporter during a match uh, and, and just decided that he was going to take that on. Uh, one of the staggering things that you see in this film is that people actually sort of defended that behaviour and made out as though Adam had done something wrong in all this. Um, but as you say, you know, we can see parallels over here. You look at, you know, what's happened with Wilfred Zahar in recent times yeah. and, and the abuse he's taken, Ian Wright. You know, it, it's there. There's that undercurrent. We've got to recognise it. We've got to talk about it. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned education because when I was reading up on the Australian dream, um, it's already being used in, in an educational circumstance in Australia, it's which right. I thought was brilliant. And Dan, yeah. Dan says in the interview that was never his intention. He just wanted to tell the story. Um, but it would be good to think that one day, you know, the Hillsborough film is used in a, a similar manner. Yeah, going back on the education side of things, I, I, I'm glad that that's a, light, a nice little surprise for Dan because he deserves that. He'll have got all the accolades and he'll, put, he'll have had job satisfaction and, you know, pride in his journalistic work and, and all that. And he'll be very satisfied about how well, um, obviously I can only talk about the Hillsborough thing, um, about how well that was received by those of us who were involved in it. I mean, I only spoke to him, you know, in, in, in his early days in his research, so I spent quite some time, wasn't used in the film, no problem at all, absolutely far from it. I'm quite happy to just be in the background and part of the jigsaw puzzle, but he still put me on the credits. And I, I didn't know anything about that. And I thought I didn't, I didn't want to be on, I'm not bothered, it doesn't matter. What mm. matters is that you told such a fabulous story, but it shows you um, just how thoughtful he is. And then, and then the fact that, you know, that that might mean something to people and yeah, okay, fair enough, yeah. But the, the fact is that if his, if his work is so good that it's going to be held up as something that can help educate youngsters uh, or whoever going forward, and if he's a little bit surprised by that, great, it's a nice surprise and it's deserved for the standard of the work that he's done. Yeah, the, the Hillsborough film won a BAFTA um, yeah. and there's some lovely scenes of, of him collecting that with uh, Phil Street and, and then to have ended up being good friends. Uh, I know, Damien, you're friends with them too. I'd uh, like to think I am as well. I've got, yeah. to, know, got to know him through doing the Anfield Rap and he's a great man. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so, so check out The Australian Dream, um, BBC Two, Sunday, 10 o'clock, uh, and let me know what you think. Um, and yeah, that's been Talking Reds. Uh, enjoyed that one, mate. Yeah, yeah. Just just to let you know, I didn't realise you were going to plug a load of t-shirts there. So otherwise, I would, have, I would have had one of Richie's on, so I'll be watching it in my Copite Clubber t-shirt. <laughs> Please go to copyclubber.com. We got we got all the plugs in. We got all the plugs <laughs> in. We're all we're all red here. Yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic stuff. Uh, Damien, you have a nice weekend, mate. Everyone and yourself, watching. great to see you. You all have a nice weekend too. Uh, that has been talking red. We'll be back next week. Hope that